But let's jump from the Dominican Republic to Brazil because Brazil has been using this technique for several years. They have a vast amount of sugar cane and being a Brazilian, I'm sure because you're with the Inter-American Development Bank and also perhaps because you're Brazilian, you're very familiar with what Brazil is doing. What exactly is Brazil doing and is this a viable alternative, the use of ethanol, or to make ethanol, I should say? Yeah, Brazil has been using ethanol in, in, as a, a fuel for vehicles for 100 years, since, since the first car no, arrived in, in Brazil. But at that time, it was just because of uh, viability uh, locally, not as an as alternative to oil, like today. So back in 73, 74, when the oil shock no, happened for the first time, um, then the situation changed in Brazil, launched uh, in 75, 1975, what was called the National Alcohol Program, Pro Alcohol, with the objective clearly to displace oil products, no? specifically gasoline. So from that date on, the, the policy was clear, no? let's displace gasoline. At the beginning, um, the production of ethanol was not uh, no, significant, so the displacement was like 5%, 10% was growing in, in using uh, ethanol as a blend with gasoline. Until 79, when it was already close to like a 20% blend, so the government at that moment launched a new way let's say, of using ethanol that was uh, to be used in vehicles designed to, to run only on ethanol. So at that time, special cars was, were produced to, to use only ethanol as a fuel. And then, at that moment, in 81, 82, um, about 60% of the gasoline consumed in Brazil was displaced by ethanol. But you know, after 82, the oil prices went down again, so all this effort reduced. And uh, only now, this year, we're back again displacing half of the gasoline using ethanol. But now, you know, new technologies, new cost figures, new oil prices. So I would say that now the, the, the alcohol plan in Brazil is much more sustainable. The people can choose every day if they're going to use ethanol or gasoline in their cars because the cars today, the flex fuel cars, as it's, it's called, uh, can run on gasoline or ethanol as the owner's choice. So that means the, there's no uh, fleet that is uh, captive of any fuel. This was the major you know, difference from today compared with the past. So every day the consumer can choose which fuel it's going to use. That makes the, the ethanol producers uh, much more competitive because if they don't have a good price compared to gasoline, the people will immediately use gasoline instead of ethanol. Of course, all gasoline in Brazil has 25% of ethanol blended. So that portion is, you know, is like a market uh, captive of the ethanol producers. But the other 25%, no, it has to be daily, on a daily basis, they have to be competitive. But today you have an additional benefit because ethanol is also a good way of reducing climate change. Because when you grow sugarcane, the plant itself absorbs the CO2 that you are producing when you run the engine. No? That you cannot do with gasoline, no? so only with sugarcane or any other uh, uh, plant that you can use to produce uh, biofuels. So, in t but this experience in Brazil is uh, easily um, trans mm -hmm. translated or uh, replicated, replicated yes. in other countries. This is not happening fast, I would say. Only Colombia has uh, a very solid program of ethanol, and now several other countries are moving, like Costa Rica, Re Dominican Republic, um, we are helping like a dozen different countries in Latin America through two major mechanisms. One, providing loans for the private sector to build biofuels plants. And the other way is providing mostly grants to the governments so they can make uh, informed decisions about biofuels in general, not just ethanol, but also other bioenergy options to see if for that particular country 
uh, these options are feasible and what kind of policy you know, they, they should establish. This, it, this is a very innovative approach to it. One of the concerns has been raised, and you can answer yes or no on this, is has the use of sugarcane, for example, put pressure on sugarcane prices and driven them up? In the United States, not long ago, the United States Congress was moving to move into the biofuels area, and it was concerned that by doing this, that there would be less food for people to consume and that it would drive food prices up. And of course, we saw riots taking place in Mexico and other places when corn was, well, the prices went up that when the corn was used to, for tortillas and things like that. Has that been the case in Brazil, or do you think that's a possibility? Always it's a possibility, but, but the way I see this situation, fuel versus food, is that any project you can do in a good way or in a bad way, right? You can build a hydropower plant uh, that doesn't affect indigenous population or, or any other environmental social effect. Or you can do with uh, damages that are not acceptable. Biofuels is not different from the other, any other project. It can be a highway, you know, a bridge. You can do with environmental impacts or, or, or mitigate them. Exactly. So biofuels is the same thing. If you are planting the feedstock in an area that was um, um, your, your, let's say, make a deforestation to plant it. Of course, it's going to be a, a negative impact. But you don't need to do that. You can do it in a proper way. If you do it in a proper way, there's no impact in food production, in, in and carbon emissions. And the bottom line is the social cost should be brought into this whenever we're doing something. Daniel, have yes. you, we're just about out of time, but have you run into the situation where the use of some other alternative has driven up the price or forced people to uh, created some kind of a hardship. Have you run into that or has that not been a problem? That has not been a problem in my personal experience. And, and, I, and, I, and I believe also that uh, uh, with uh, the energy sources that are available in Haiti, it's, it's, it's quite limited anyway. And uh, uh, very often, very often, uh, uh, we have uh, had situation where rationment of uh, of, of the fuel had to take place and people had to uh, somehow uh, measure how far they would go driving in particular. Mm -hmm. yes. Well, these, these are certainly very difficult issues to deal with. There's no easy answer. If there were, we probably would have found it years ago. But of course, it's very important that people like you be involved in this and that you're involved through a private sector group right. with uh, CIMACT. Right. .net, it just in case people would like to go to www.simac.net, and you're with the Inter-American Development Bank, a quasi-public organization at iadb.org. But of course, there are other sources too. Uh, folks could find out what the United Nations has been doing in this area by going to un.org, or they could uh, Google the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change (IPCC), which is the major United Nations entity that really created the majority of the studies that laid out the situation with this change in climate, with this global warming. But again, I, I want to thank you so very much, Arnaldo and Daniel, for a very interesting and a very informative Thank you program. very much. It was thank a pleasure. Thanks for having us. Thank you. thank you. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us on today's Global Connections program.